Good to go. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Um, my name is Jason Gell. I'm going to talk about um, this is my coulda, shoulda, woulda talk. It uh, basically goes over zero days that have been made their way into the media. Talking about shell shock and heart bleed and things of that nature, and the impact that they've had on us. And uh, maybe also kind of guide us towards some of the things that we haven't been paying attention to that maybe we should. So it is a little bit, I'd say it's sort of a friendly rant, but it's meant to be helpful. So, uh, First, a little on me. Uh, I am a senior security consultant at a company called Secure Ideas. My slides are running away from me. Um, security is. Yeah, security is based out of Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we, we were down at DerbyCon, and uh, a couple of us were asked to, to speak here today. And, um, gladly obliged. We really enjoy what we do. A lot of it is uh, security consulting, pen, penetration testing. We do a lot of education to teaching classes. And uh, we like to talk about what we do. We just, we're very passionate about it as a group. So. Uh, you know, having this type of opportunity. It's nice with a smaller group, too. It's a little more intimate. Um, we, we really enjoy that. Uh, I have lots of experience with education, or with, um, with software development uh, prior to getting into security. So I was a software developer, software uh, system architect, um, and, and then I basically made my way into application security. This sets me apart from a lot of my counterparts because you'll notice that a lot of folks in security, they came from more of the networking side of things. So, um, yeah. That is where I, I do focus day to day. Uh, luckily, in a small consultant firm, my security is I get to do a bit of everything, which is fantastic. I'm always learning new things. Uh, but my strengths are definitely on the web application side, mobile and testing, that sort of thing. I like to hack things. That's what I what I really do. And by that I mean both the innovative problem solving as well as breaking things. I like, I like to break things. Um, that's why I moved away from building software and now I break things. So it's fun. But we always do it with permission. Um, and then just a you know a few other notes. I I'm a runner, I have been doing that as much as I should lately. Just start the show. Um, and uh, I'm a home brewer, which is pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool anyway. So let's get into the, the, uh, the talk. Um, so what keeps you up at night? I'm sure we have a lot of folks in the room who are system administrators, network, um, management, that sort of area, those types of job roles. And you, you might be thinking about zero days, am I going to get caught off guard, especially after last year. 2014 was pretty nasty for a lot of us, right? Um, you get blindsided by something, um, you know, heart bleed comes out, or, um, or shell shock comes out, or something else similar to that, and then you're thinking, oh, I have to go through, I've got to check all my systems, um, you know, I'm going to be literally awake up all night because I'm going to be up until 3 a.m. trying to fix these things or patch these things or, or put together uh, release plans. Um, and, it, I mean, we also we don't want to be the next uh, target, for lack of a better term, to show up in the media, right? None of us want, want to be in that sort of situation, so. So the question really is, this is the question that I want to pose is, do these things really matter? The zero days, they do. They really do matter. But do they matter as much as we think they do compared to other things? And that's really what I want to get down to today is, are we <coughs> spending maybe a little bit too much time just paying attention to what the media is telling us needs to be fixed? and ignoring some of the things that probably also need to be addressed. Um, so that's, that's really what I want to talk about. A lot of today's talk is it's about the low-hanging fruit that's out there that, as a pen tester, I see every day. So I'll, I'll go in, I'll do a pen test somewhere. I do I know, somewhere between 25 and 40 pen tests in here. Depends on the size and all that. And 
very frequently, and I talk to um, the other folks in my company as well and in other companies, we run into a lot of the same sorts of things cropping up over and over again. And that's really what we want to talk about. So, um, attack targets. We have, you can, you can take um, basically any sort of vulnerability that's out there and kind of put it into one of two buckets. It's, it can be used in a more generalized attack or it can be used in a very specific orchestrated attack. Okay. And what you'll find is for the generalized attacks, those are usually your newer, shiny types of vulnerabilities. So that's the first thing that's going to happen when a new zero days mounts. Somebody out there is going to write some kind of script or something to start scanning the internet or finding out who's vulnerable to it. And so it is, is much more generalized. Everyone's a target, really. If you have an IP address, then we're going to try it out and see if it works. Um, so that's one. It's a wide one. And then you have your specific targets. Those are the uh, maybe company, financial, maybe it's you know, government, whatever it is. Um, and that's where you were thinking more, okay, well, there's spear phishing involved, there's this orchestrated attack with pivot points, and, you know, it's, it, it ends up being a lot more, um, a lot more detailed and a lot more planned than a generalized attack, which seems, sometimes might seem a little half -assed. So you have to ask yourself, what sort of target are you for? And the result is, the, the reality is, all of us really fall into both buckets. It, the vulnerability itself is going to change over time. So if we look at something like right now, for example, let's just take Heartbleed, for example. When Heartbleed first came out, it was people were scanning the internet looking for it. And so it really fell into that sort of generalized bucket. But now, if, uh, if you have a, an adversary who's actually getting onto your network, um, they're going to leverage that. They're going to leverage Heartbleed if they find it on your systems as part of a more restricted attack. So it's now moved into that, that second, more specific area. Um, so we, we really have to be thinking in terms of, you know, um, I could be a target for either one of these. And we need to be prepared as best we can for both. So that's. In a moment, I'm going to start going through these. But basically, I'm hoping that today, with the experience that I've had with penetration testing <coughs> and vulnerability assessments and, and things of that nature, that I can help kind of show you where the trends are. So there are some things out there that the media told us to fix. We'll take a look at those, and then I'll point out the things that the media maybe didn't notice or hasn't been really talking about that we, in a lot of cases, haven't really addressed or haven't addressed fully. Hopefully that will give you some ideas on, on what else to, um, where, where else to focus some effort. So, first of all, we're going to talk about a shell shock. Shell shock didn't have a really cool logo on it, so I had to make one up. That's the best I could come up with. Um, I don't know if it's really that good. Uh, so basically, shell shock really boils down to a handful of characters. It's an injection. Right? So it's these things here. That, that is shell shock right there on the screen, for those who, who haven't seen it. Um, it's basically just those characters. And when they're in, inserted in the right place, the command that follows those is the command that will be executed on the shell. And if you're not familiar with what that means, executed on the shell. Basically, the shell is, is that's of the operating system, so via Unix, usually it's going to be Unix. Um, uh, but you can get uh, shell exploits for Unix or Windows uh, or what have you, and it's, it's executing on the operating system itself. So if you can execute commands on the operating system itself, you basically have control of that box. Um, and it, it becomes a very likely pivot point for a control of other machines on the network. So it doesn't take much. So when Shellshop was first discovered, Robert Graham post posted a blog and he said, I'm running a scan right now of the internet to test for the recent bash vulnerability. He was referring to Shellshop. And this is um, this is basically 
the uh, mass scan configuration part of it anyway that, that he had out there. And if you take a look at it, you'll see, remember those characters I had on the previous slide? There they are right there. So that's part of his configuration, he's looking for that. And what was he doing afterwards? He was just pinging his own. So he's basically trying shell script, or trying to <coughs> run shell shot in the system. And then if he got a ping back, he would know that it actually executed to so execute command. Yeah. It's really that simple. That's scary. Yeah. So, um, and you can, of course, do a whole lot more than pain this time. Right? So, it sounds really bad. Um, good thing it really only happened once, except that it didn't. Uh, it, took, it took a little while, a few iterations before we actually really nailed down um, the, the variations in shell shock to get to a point where we knew what to fix. So, fortunately, um, fortunately that's addressed. Now, I do want to point out one other thing with shell shock. When Robert, with Robert Graham scanned in particular, he was scanning basically uh, HTTPS, so 443, four, 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 across uh, every IP address. And only just the default file in the file in the uh, web path. So the scary thing about that is there's over 65,000 ports on, on the machine. Obviously, not all of those are going to be used, but there could be a lot more services running than just HTTPS on any given box. And there could be a lot more files that might be vulnerable other than just the file of the default directory. So when he ran that scan, that was a very limited scope scan. It's not, it didn't cover um, every possibility that's out there. So Shellshock, interesting thing about Shellshock is that for the most part, now there are some others, but for the most part, the two primary targets of Shellshock are mod CGI and mod CGI D. And you don't really have to know a whole lot about mod CGI, except that it is a, a type of technology that's been around since, well, it was, the term was coined in 1997. It was actually uh, around basically as long as the internet. It's that old, this really, really old server-side scripting stuff, because it actually executes within the shell, um, which is, as we just discussed, that's pretty dangerous. Right? We don't want to be doing that. Um, they're relatively slow, the resource hogs. I know there's probably been advances to try to make them better, um, but uh, there are a lot of newer technologies, and by newer I mean even, even technologies that have been around, or languages that have been around for uh, 10 or 15 years that do a much better job of insulating the operating system from what's going on on the website. Uh, so there are so many alternative options that are safer it's just a wonder that there are so many machines out there that still support CGI to begin with. Um, and that's, that's really the takeaway from that, isn't just that, hey, don't use CGI, it's take a close look at where you have old stuff there. So, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we find in pen tests that's related to this. We almost always find, especially in our internals, on internal tests, unsupported systems. So we'll find unsupported, like old operating systems that shouldn't be there. I mean, it should have been upgraded or decommissioned or something. Um, and we find, the other one that we find a lot of is web servers. So it'll be some ancient version of Apache that was deployed on some device, you know, back in 2001. And it's still sitting out there. Um, and it's, you know, it's no longer supported at all. And if it's not supported, that means that if there is a security flaw with it, you're not going to get a patch. It's just there isn't one. So definitely keep an eye out for these. And I, I, I mentioned, you know, these are things I find during pen tests. I wasn't actually doing pen testing to find these. I was just doing the scan. Um, all of these things can be found just with a scan uh, for fingerprinting on systems. So just identify, you know, what is the, the type of system give it a name and the version that's out there. And that's really all the information I need. I can look up whether or not it's supported with that information. Um, the other one that we find, and this one is, is even more rampant than the, uh, the unsupported software, is unpatched. Unpatched software. And I don't mean 
I, I can understand well we fell behind on patch and we're you know two or three months behind and none of those seem critical. That's you know that happens all the time. We're gonna see that. But it's the unpatched software that it's been unpatched for one, two, sometimes three years or more. And it really starts falling into this category of, you know, this is really, really dangerous at this point. Do you even know how many patches behind you are on? And, and this is something, I mean, it, it's scary when we run into this because we're, we're, the issue is obviously not just, you know, this one system at that point. It's got to be something systemic within the organization because we usually don't find just one system out there that's unpatched like that. It'll be several, uh, or in some really bad cases, all of them. So. Um, ASX servers is one. Uh, the web server versions always seem to fall behind. Um, CMS plugins, everyone talks about WordPress and how bad that is. Probably, probably seen a lot of uh, WordPress announcements over the past year. Uh, most of it's in the plugins. We've got a couple on WordPress itself. But those, are, those types of things, they really do need to be kept up to date. All right, so the next one I want to spend a little bit of time on is Boodle. Everyone hear about Boodle? It's SSL related something. Uh, this is the only one I think really deserved an acronym because, I mean, who can really remember how to say that? Adding Oracle on downgraded legacy encryption. So this one affects SSL 3.0 specifically. Um, in e it takes advantage of something that they call, they call it the downgrade dance. So basically you have your client side, you have your server side, they're trying to negotiate, well, what level of encryption do we both support that's the highest level? And during that negotiation, that's where the, the vulnerability uh, basically allows a downgrade to a level that shouldn't be acceptable. So what's wrong with SSL3? This is what we're talking about Poodle. First of all, it only supports um, two modes of use. One is, is using uh, an RC4 stream, which is not related to the, there's vulnerabilities in RC4 that are not related to Poodle. Uh, Poodle is very specifically, has to do with the cyber blockchain. Um, so we're already using, like even if you set SSL 3.0, to be used, uh, you will, will probably have already turned off RC4. In that case, you can yourself on with Poodle. And so that's why SSL 3.0 in general is really not a good idea anymore. So I just give you an idea of what it does. Um, it takes, basically, you, you, take, uh, you take a request over um, HTTPS, and you repeat that request, and you change the, the, um, the padding on the, the handshake of the SSL. And by changing that, you're, you're able to, over the course of 256 requests, derive one of the characters, basically, that, that's uh, in, in the request. And so um, if you take, for example, like an MD5 hash, maybe that's being used as a session cookie, that'd be 32 characters long. So if you know the exact position in the request where you're going to find that, then you would have to do basically 256 times 32 requests in order to steal that cookie. That's really what it comes down to. So it's, it seems like a lot of requests, but really that's, and I don't know my math, 256 times 32, I can here. I thought they made them, I know that off the top of the head. Um, but it's really not that many um, in, in this day and age, just not that many requests. And then out of that, of course, you get a session cookie. So um, it's 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 pretty bad. Definitely fix it if you have it. Um, but it's also should be fairly detectable. It should be safe. A lot of requests go across the uh, the wire, and especially it's a very measured amount too. So um, I don't know if there are rules out there that specifically look for the views of Google or not. But I would think that we could derive some just based on the number of requests that have gone through. Um, some honorable mentions that call, kind of fall into the same category. Um, free, if you've heard of that one, that's, and, and Logjam is another one. Um, Freak is, is specifically, both of these actually have to do with the um, export keys getting, getting down and the, uh, using the, the fact that the US government 
only allow the export of uh, easier to decrypt keys. Um, and uh, Freak is, is specifically towards the RSA part of the, the handshake, whereas Logjam is against the def definite common uh, key exchange. And in both cases, both of these are also downgraded tasks. So it's a case of, you know, maybe you were intending to negotiate at a higher level of encryption, but it's going to make use of the fact that we do this downgrade dance, client side, server side, trying to find, you know, the common ground. And they end up negotiating to a lower level of encryption than was initially intended. Um, so now, what other types of, of encryption issues do we find when we do pen tests and vulnerability assessments? Well, weak SSL configurations is probably one of our number one findings. We all, I mean, we might as well just put that in a template for, for most of our pen tests because we always run into this. Um, so, and by old, I mean things that are worse than, than pools. Poodles takes, what do we say, 256 times 32 requests in order to be able to actually decrypt a, a cookie. Um, we also find the use of RC4, which I don't know offhand how bad, how easy it is to crack that. It takes fewer requests. Um, but it is has been proven to have several weaknesses in the past. And then there's um, uh, also the use of, of extremely weak ciphers, so uh, like keys that only have um, is it 56, 56 bits to them? Um, so you start getting into areas where um, the, the encryption is, is just, it's much weaker than, than 3.0 is, even with its problems. Um, another problem that we run into, we, we still see this, not super frequently, but frequently enough that it worries me, is uh, legacy systems that are, are uh, using really bad ways to store passwords. Um, ignoring the sometimes clear text password storage that we run across. <laughs> the use of MD5. So, message digest 5. Uh, basically, if it's a hash, we, we're told we need to hash our password, so this is a hash. That's a good thing, right? Uh, but it's, it's not solved in, in many of these cases. Which means, if I use password 123, and Nathan uses password 123, then they're both going to show up as the same hash in the database. So we haven't added salt in order to make sure that each one is different. But what's worse is the fact that it's MD5. Because MD5, especially if they're weak passwords and dictionary words, um, we all have, everyone in this room has access to one of the, the uh, biggest rainbow tables around. Rainbow table allows basically it's a lookup table for MD5, gets back to whatever the dictionary word is. It's called Google. You take an MD5 and put it into Google, and it take it, it sends back the uh, the actual word. Try it. So, um, so watch out for that. If you have old systems that are still using, and I'm not, I don't mean to just pick on MD5. If you're using any older hash algorithm, um, it's a good idea to start looking at something better, and I can give you some some better options uh, afterwards. Um, oh, and yeah, of course, I don't know that I really need to say this part, but we find other encryption systems as well. So we'll find, you know, an administrative login somewhere where it's over HTTP. In that case, I don't need any Poodles or other uh, SSL flaws. You know, if I command in the middle of the traffic, I'm going to have the password and the username. Um, So the next one we have is Heartbleed. Heartbleed to me is, was actually probably the scariest one to come out because of a couple of reasons. One, it's really, really hard to detect. Or, I mean, nobody really, it's been around for a really long time and nobody really knew about it because it wasn't showing up in any law. So that, that's pretty scary. The other reason is because if you were doing what you were supposed to be doing, which is using encryption for your traffic, that, that's what made you vulnerable. Um, so talk a little bit about what it is. Heart, heartbeat extension, that's, that's what kind of leads into where Heartbeat came from. So everybody remember back in the day where um, 
SSL is something you use carefully because you're worried about performance issues. Right? It's going to slow everything down. And they had the SSL accelerators and um, um, all that <coughs> happened. Well, somewhere along the way, um, our really smart people make up these algorithms. Uh, put in a basically this, this heartbeat sort of mechanism in there to keep basically it it added I guess um, a level of of uh, uh, persistence I guess to connections it, it didn't you know hold the connection open but it at least allowed you to determine if the connection was still uh, viable. And if you could continue to use the same negotiated handshake over and over again, um, so that's you know it's a good thing. It really, really helped performance. And um, basically, the way it works, of course, is on the one side, we'll say the client side, we say, "Hey, I'm still around. Say hi if you are too." And then the other side, you know, you get the hi. Yep, I'm still here. And the the problem with it, though, is, is that what was actually happening is in that initial request, say hi if you're, if you're still around. By the way, hi is 65, 64K. And that's what happens is the, the service I was allowing the client to dictate the length of the response. And so what would happen is you would get the response that was coming back on these heartbeats would be hi plus, and, you know, about of whatever was in memory that came after the word hi. Um, and in a lot of cases, that was going to be what? What, were, what are we going to find in memory of for uh, like HTTPS? Might find passwords or keys, probably certificates maybe. Um, cookies, very likely. You know, just think about the types of things that would be sitting in memory on, on a web, in this case on a web server. Keeping in mind that SSL is in other places as well. So, um, so the types of things that that are similarly scary is, is the number of times you find the default credentials. So I don't even need to run heartbeat against your system in order to gain your credentials if you're using the default credentials for whatever that is. If I can go into an admin console somewhere and I type admin, admin, and it lets me in, you know, I don't even need to run any special tools or anything. In fact, my, my traffic isn't even considered attack traffic. That's just a normal user logging in. So talk about, you know, blogs aren't going to find that. Um, and, and that happens surprisingly frequently. Um, there are a lot of systems out there, and it seems to actually be getting worse because of, and I, I suspect it's because of the virtualization. So a lot of companies are just spinning up servers, you know, over and over again. Um, and so, because we've actually gone to where they said, we have 1,000, maybe, maybe 1,200 machines that we get there, and there's, there's four or 5,000 of them. Virtual, virtualized, um, but that's that's the sort of thing that happens, right? So they they, they don't have uh, secure defaults, um, they have bad configurations, and so we end up with lots of uh, lots of use of default credentials, uh, weak passwords kind of falls into the same bucket, uh, hyper aggressive mode, pre shared key. So for your VPNs, that's one that pops up uh, quite frequently. Um, what that is, that's just a mode of operation for, for VPNs, aggressive mode, uh, pre shared key. And it's with, uh, it depends on the implementation, but with uh, a valid username, it's actually possible with uh, this mode set in there to actually be able to uh, get access to that pre shared key and basically crack it offline. So, um, and then uh, unencrypted session cookies we find. Okay. Um, this one probably didn't get everyone's attention when it showed up in the media. It really got mine because I'm a web guy. I do lots of web stuff. Uh, there was this thing that came out it was earlier this year, actually. Um, universal process scripting is what it was called. And for those who do uh, any sort of patch management, you probably will remember sometime in February where you had to push out this patch to all Internet Explorers because it was really, really bad. And basically, um, it's not a, uh, it wasn't actually a process scripting flaw at all. Um, that's just 
was taking advantage of what was taking advantage of, of the flaw. The flaw was in the same origin policy management on the browser. Um, so it was a, a bypass for same origin policy, which, is, which I found pretty interesting. So same origin policy, for those who are not, not sure what that is, it's a feature, it's a feature probably a bad word, yes. <laughs> But it is, it's a, it's a browser-enforced security feature. Uh, so according to that policy, what that means is code running on one page is not allowed to interact with the content of, some other, content of a page that's on some other uh, origin. An origin is basically um, like the, the host name, the domain, um, and the protocol, the port, a combination of those. And, um, it basically, he makes it so that uh, the whole internet can't hack the rest of it. So if, if the same origin policy wasn't in place, then you can run JavaScript on any on any browser, and it could be used to attack websites anywhere else. So things would be pretty bad with that. So it's um, a really important part of, of our security, and it's built into all um, all modern browsers. It's been there for a long time. Uh, the bypass itself that was found back in January requires the use of an iframe. And basically it allows the attacker to load some content into an iframe. So an iframe can load content from somewhere else. It's not supposed to be able to interact with that content, just display it. And what will happen with this bypass is they're actually able to trick the, um, the browser window into thinking that the content that was loaded from that, that other origin actually came from the same origin that we're already on. Therefore, it bypass the same origin policy. Um, when this came out, if anyone, did anyone actually see, uh, read up on this at all, or see the demo that came out? Um, the demo that came out, it, it, there was this demo, and you basically had to click on a bunch of things. I, I was able to reproduce all of the functionality within this uh, same origin uh, bypass without having to have any user interaction at all, so it's completely invisible. Um, so it's really bad. <laughs> and you would think that you think that it had been fixed. Um, it's that little red box thing that has that has a date on there with a vulnerability that looks very much like the one that came out earlier this year. The date on that is. The 9th of June, 2004. So something very similar was reported way back then on Internet Explorer. Uh, both involve iframe. That was, that was this one that came out this year. That's the one from way back then. I just found that really interesting, and I'm very curious if it was just something that never got fixed, or did it get fixed and came out again, or is it just something entirely different? I don't know. And I don't know who to ask either. Who would actually give me a straight answer? Um, there have been other flaws in packing iframes. Uh, 2003, this was actually pretty interesting. Uh, Paul Stone, he put together this uh, white paper on what he called a pixel perfect timing attack. What he was able to do with this is take um, the basically the, the 3D rendering filters that are inside of, um, that are built in HTML5, supposedly for doing graphics or text manipulation. And like, let's say you take a, a shadow and you make it really, really thick. It takes longer to render pixels off of that than if um, you, you take a whole lot longer to render those than if it's just regular text that didn't have a drop shadow on it. So because of those timing changes, uh, the differences on there, you're able to determine whether or not a pixel in a specific position inside of an iframe that you're not supposed to be able to interact with whether or not that pixel is basically black or white, whether it's on or off. And using that in com combined with uh, OCR, uh, object character recognition techniques, uh, he could basically use a frame to have you fetch content, and then you would be able to read content out of there. So um, maybe, uh, let's say you target a user with have them visit some page, and then the iframe would load up some page that you don't have access to, you're not supposed to, but assuming they've already logged in, or maybe it's inside some internal site, be able to actually read content out of that iframe that you shouldn't be able to see. 
and get that content back to the attacker, which is pretty interesting. So protection from iframe. Uh, everyone sees this a lot in the X-frame options. I see that get ignored all the time. It always ends up being a low on a report. Um, what can we do? I, but I'm a stickler for it because I'm a web guy. So uh, it is supported across all major web browsers. Uh, you, you'll start to see content security policy coming out. Probably, I mean, it's been around for a couple of years, but uh, adoption on CSP is very, very, very slow because it's very hard to to adopt for existing applications. Um, so we'll probably see X frame options as the, the uh, mean mitigation out there. And all the X-frame options does is it limits when iframes are being permitted on a page. So is it allowed to load content from outside the page or can it only load content from the same <coughs> origin? Um, so that's basically. Uh, so that's all I have for specifically talking about you know very specific um, attacks. That are there um, in the zero days. I want to mention a couple of other really important items that we find regularly during assessments that are related to these that are also very helpful things to know. We probably already all know them. One of them is are you monitoring your logs? Okay, so I can't stress how important this is. We very, very frequently will do a pen test or an assessment somewhere and we'll ask, hey, did you guys see this? You were just talking about this here in your talk as well. Did, um, did you guys notice this? What did you see? And sometimes they don't see anything, or sometimes we do something really bad on a Monday and we hear about it on Thursday night. <laughs> it's a whole week's gone by and, and uh, the, the SOC hasn't really realized what's going on. Um, and sometimes there is no log monitoring going on, or sometimes there's not, not even any logs. So, um, this is is I think having very good log monitoring in place is probably one of the best things that you can do. Um, the one of the biggest problems that we have these days is that um, everybody's getting breached. Right? It's, it's got to a point where we don't. Um, again, what Nathan was saying in his talk earlier is we don't really even pay attention anymore to all of the breaches that are coming out because they're coming out so frequently. So uh, what we need to do is uh, be prepared for the inevitable, which is you know, there's a good chance that you will be breached at some point, at some level. So make sure that you actually have what you need in place to be able to recover from that, detect it, find it, um, and, and patch whatever issues caused it. The next one is scanning. Is scanning even occurring? If it is occurring, are you, do you have a good plan for following up on those scans? Almost everything I showed you in my talk today, all of these things that I, that I mentioned, are items that aren't found with actual pen testing. Most of those are found with Nessus or Nexpos or, or like scanners, automated scanning. So if, if I'm getting to on site to do a test or, or if I'm doing a remote test and I'm running into a whole bunch of these sorts of things, it's, it's really a waste of money for, for whoever's hired me because they could just as easily uh, put a scanner in place and catch a lot of these things. Um, so, and, it, and it's, it's a little disheartening sometimes, uh, the number of things that we find that, that were just picked up at a scan. Um, nothing really special, just a default scan. So make sure that, that you're actually doing your scanning. So takeaways, um, evaluate risks of zero days as they come out. So when you see something new in the media, take a close look at it, evaluate the risk just like anything else. Um, I, there seemed to be, a, I mean, a lot of emphasis went into fixing things that the media made a big deal out of because it had a fancy name. And it doesn't mean those things don't need to be addressed, but they do need to be risk assessed just like the rest. In some cases, some for some people, maybe it doesn't really impact them as much. For others, others, others it does. Um, but also, make sure you're you're not losing track of some of the other stuff, like the old technologies out there, the patching. I mean, 
patching in and use of unsupported systems, like I said, that, that's one of the, the most common things we find. Um, SSL is another extremely common uh, use of default credentials. I mean, all of these things on this list, those are probably the, some of the most, the most common items that we find on almost every single test. Um, and all of those are things that we can find fairly easily with a scan. And don't forget about the little things. I mentioned iframes on there. One of the reasons I picked on that is it's, it's the little guy, but it's there have been problems with it, different types of problems with it, year after year. So it just keeps coming back to haunt us. So don't, don't forget about it. It needs to be um, taken care of at some point as well. And probably the, the uh, some of the most important things, observe. Keep your eyes open. Uh, it can, a lot of, of what we do in security can become very monotonous. So it's important to stay vigilant and actually stay on top of it. Of uh, what's there. Monitor your logs, scan your network, make sure you have a good remediation plan <coughs> to support you need to fix things. And that's it. So, thank you very much.